One of the scariest things about strategy is most strategists can't clearly articulate what goes into a strategy. By the end of this video, you will know all the ingredients and be able to write a strategy statement with confidence. We're gonna break it down into the three essential building blocks and two important perspectives that you need to build a strategy. A strategy is made up of three essential blocks, the goal, the problem, and the solution, and two perspectives of the business point of view and the consumer point of view. With a marketing strategy, the thing that makes it unique versus other types of business strategy is that we're trying to align two interest groups. We're trying to come up with a solution that will drive a result for the business, and we're also trying to drive a result for the consumers. As important as the business problems are to you as someone who's working in the business, for the consumer who's buying your product, they really don't care about the problems of your business. All they care about is solving their problems. This juggling act of looking after the interests of two different parties informs how we write a strategy on a page in marketing. That's why I created the nesting strategy, as it looked to address both parties in one statement. With the nesting strategy, it has the solution nested inside the consumer goal and problem, which is nested inside the business goal and problem. Let's look at a quick example for VW. The business problem for VW was that two doors under indexes with 45 plus demographic. The consumer problem was parents associated parenthood with a loss of freedom. The insight was that age brings more freedom when it comes to parenthood. So the message was to show that downsizing to a VW is a sign of freedom. To help reach the consumer goal of parents seeing that they have freedom to put their choices first, helping to reach their business goal of increasing by 2% VW's two-door test drives with parents in Q4 2021. If you're after more examples of strategies on a page, I've got a link to a free presentation which has 10 more examples of nested strategy in the description. Now that you have a fill in the blanks formula, you may think you're halfway there, wrong. I have seen my fair share of nightmare examples of fill in the blank strategies. Fill in the blank formulas don't stop you from filling those blanks with trash. So it's important to know what you need to fill those blanks in with and what bad and great looks like. So let's dive into the different sections. A goal is a desired state for where we want to be after we have executed our campaign. When we think about the business goal of advertising, it is usually pretty straightforward, which is increasing our market share, sales, or reducing the price sensitivity around our product. The one thing to remember with the business goal is that we want to make sure that it's smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. The goal should ladder up to the bigger business problem the company is trying to address and is actually achievable with the resources that we have at hand, which are limited by time, money, and people. A bad way to write the VW goal would have been increase VW's two-door test drives. This lacks detail. How much do we need to increase it by? It also has no timeline. We could be trying to do this in one month, one year or maybe even 10 years. Now let's look at how to write it properly. Increase by 2% VW's two-door test drives with parents in Q4 2021. This is specific. We know by how much and we know it's with parents as the target consumer. We know how to measure it, it is hopefully achievable within the budget and it's relevant as we know advertising cannot do everything and make us buy a car but it can get them to test drive. And finally, it's timely as we know it has to be done by Q4 2021. Consumer goals are a little more complex than writing out the goals of your company. As much as economists would like to think we are completely rational creatures, we're just not. We have a number of goals that impact the way we act. 
Our job is to work out what are the underlying goals that impact us to buying the products that we're looking at. We are starting with the solution and trying to work back to the question. When we think of goals for ourselves, we probably think of goals as some big thing that we only set for New Year's resolutions. However, goals work at every single level, from the macro goals of I want to lose weight this year to the micro goals of I need to keep my eyes directed at this YouTube video. The reason that goals are so important for businesses is that this is what compels us to buy products. The further we get away from the desired state that we want to be in, creates tension and products and services help us get closer to those desired states and relieve that tension. For instance, your desired state may be to feel relaxed and at ease. The problem is, is that you're working in a stressful marketing job and you're getting further away from that goal. So the product of a holiday may help reduce that distance from you being close to your desired state. If you're anything like me, you might be getting overwhelmed with how many goals there are how do you know where to start? Luckily, a lot of academics have thought about this. And one of my favorite groups of academics actually broke it down to 24 basic human goals, which were broken into internal and external goals. I use this sheet whenever I start a project. If you're interested in it, I put a link in the description and you can download it from here. Psychologists have suggested that goals can be both positive and negative because they both drive us to action. A negative goal is one from which behavior is directed away from and is referred to as an avoidance object. A positive goal is one towards which behavior is directed. Thus, it is often referred to as an approach object. With the goals, there is usually an avoidance goal for every approach goal. For example, people may play the video game Call of Duty to experience excitement, which would be an approach goal. You can imagine the negative avoidance goal being true for this too. They may want to avoid being bored, so they play Call of Duty. The arousal goal is being activated in both goal statements. Again, the approach and avoidance goal is visible in the free 24 goals cheat sheet that you can get in the description. Goals are tricky because we usually don't just have one goal. We usually have a few working at once. For instance, when I stress eat, I have a goal of physical well-being and feeling healthy. But in that moment, my goal of avoiding emotional distress is larger and eating that chocolate is going to get me closer to feelings of happiness instead of stress. Our job as strategists is to untangle the different goals that we have at one moment. The other thing about goals is that one product can solve multiple goals. For instance, a holiday may be to try and feel more relaxed, but it also might be to experience a sense of connectedness with nature or to avoid feeling trapped in the boundaries of life or to feel unique and different. Again, it's your job to untangle these goals and work out what is most important to your audience. This requires you to do research by talking and listening to your audience. With goals, we're not thinking about them all the time. We have triggers which make us think about our goal. These moments usually make us aware that we're getting further away or closer to our goal. The moments when people are getting further away from their goals are when people are receptive to having products or services help us close that gap. Understanding these problems that get us further away from our goals and how our product can help address them are important parts of the strategy. Most marketers feel very comfortable telling us what the problem of the business is. However, where they struggle is working out the problems that the consumer is trying to solve. They keep confusing their problems for the consumers. For instance, the wrong way to write the business and consumer problem for Snickers would be, Snickers is fighting a losing battle in the chocolate bar category dominated by taste. Problem is, guys aren't aware that Snickers are the most filling bar. A consumer problem for guys is not that they need to be aware of Snickers. That is the business problem. Their consumer goal is that they want to feel part of the group. 
The problem being they act out when they're hungry and the group doesn't want them around. So the right way to write the consumer problem is Snickers is fighting a losing battle in the chocolate category dominated by taste. The consumer problem is guys are acting out with friends when hungry. So how do you get to the right consumer problem? Unlike the business perspective, with the consumer's perspective, you start at the finish, the product, and then you work your way back to the problem and then the goal that we need to solve. When you don't have a problem statement, the thing that I like to do is think about it like the quiz game Jeopardy. In Jeopardy, contestants are presented with general knowledge clues in the form of answers and must phrase their responses in the form of questions. For instance, a clue would be, this princess of pop rose to fame with her two 1999 hits, Baby One More Time and Oops, I Did It Again, to which the correct response is, who is Britney Spears? We need to think the same way when we just start with the product features. So for instance, Snickers, they may have started with the features of the product. Our bar might not be the tastiest bar, but it is the most filling with more nuts than any other chocolate bar. Then they may have identified problems it can solve for, which is that it saves you from being hungry between meals. Then you have to ask, why is this important? When you're not hungry between meals, you're not acting out amongst your mates. And when you're not acting out, you can be part of your friendship group, which is the ultimate goal. That is how we work back to the goal that we're trying to achieve. solution, insights and single-minded propositions. The word insight gets overused in business. An insight is not every fact you hear. We need to stop calling everything we learn an insight. An insight needs to be a revelation to the masses, not just you and your co-workers. An insight needs to pass the triple R test. It needs to be a revelatory truth, rewiring and the right solution. A revelatory truth is something that is true but we're hearing it for the first time. It should evoke a response in us like saying out aloud, huh, aha, uh -huh, or ah. It needs to rewire the way that consumers think. This is because if we keep going the way we're going, the consumers aren't gonna change their behavior and buy our product. Then finally, it needs to be the right solution. It needs to be relevant to the problem we're trying to solve, not just any insight. For example, let's look at startup female razor brand, Billy. The problem for women was that body hair was seen as a reoccurring evil that they were constantly fighting. The insight was that shaving brands want to sell us razors to remove body hair, but they were too scared to even show body hair in their commercials. Billy reframed the problem to show us that body hair wasn't the issue, it's the media. Billy had a single-minded proposition, which was to proudly celebrate our choice around body hair. Their ads didn't pretend like body hair didn't exist, which made their work stand out, which gets us to our next point. The single-minded proposition often sounds like the answer to the problem that is knocking around in our consumers' heads. When we say the solution in our advertising, they hear the tension release from the problem and they see they are getting closer to their desired state. The single-minded proposition is a statement that we want the creatives to capture in the idea. It must include the brand and how it plays a role in solving the problem and getting our consumers closer to their desired state. 
Let's look at an example for Cheetos. The business goal was to launch the new Cheetos popcorn and increase share by the snacking market by 1.2% by 2020. The consumer goal was that Gen Z are trying to feel relaxed in a life full of worry. The consumer problem was that culture had told them that they needed to find a side hustle and optimize every minute of every day. The insight being that in an efficiency driven multitasking world, having Cheetos dust forces you to do nothing but enjoy the snack. The message that Cheetos wanted to drive home is that showing that Cheetos dust is the perfect alibi for doing nothing else. We see this when he raises his hands and shows us the Cheetos dust stopping him from doing anything. Let's look at the spot now. Cheetos has popcorn now? Hey, I'm gonna need you to... Never mind. You can't touch this. Help. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. I trust you. Stop! Hammer time! I touched it! New Cheetos popcorn. It's a Cheetos thing. In the spot, we see our protagonist being asked to help move house, help spot a friend, help look after a baby. However, thanks to Cheetos dust, they have the perfect alibi to just relax and not do any extra work. This document is something that you always wanna have around. So no matter who comes onto the project, they can look at this one page and understand why we are doing what we're doing. This is so important in advertising, as sometimes to people in finance, it can look like what we're doing is just making art for art's sake. So hopefully you found this interesting. Let me know if you've got any questions in the comments.